Landscapes Forum for asking me to speak this morning because I see the focus of the forum as being highly relevant to the global effort here to tackle climate change and also the broader global effort to achieve sustainable development. And as so many here are aware, when we move on from the Millennium Development Goals at the end of next year to new Sustainable Development Goals at the end of next year, this is a transformational change and it opens up the prospect of development which truly is in harmony with nature and not in opposition to it. We have witnessed a lot of progress on this earlier development agenda of the Millennium Development Goals, including on some of the environmental targets which were set in them. So we can say the goal of halving poverty was met around five years ahead of schedule. We can say that on balance, uh, gender parity in primary education has been achieved and most children now enroll in a primary school. We can say that levels of mortality targeted in the MDGs have decreased significantly. And on MDG 7, on environmental sustainability, we can point to the coverage of protected areas growing. Not enough, of course, but now standing at somewhere close to 15% of the terrestrial areas and close to 10% of coastal marine areas worldwide. This, of course, helps safeguard biodiversity and the essential services our planet's ecosystems provide, but more must be done. And as well targeted in the MDGs uh, were the targets in the Montreal Protocol, and we've seen that huge reduction of 98% in the consumption of ozone-depleting substances. But climate change, without doubt, is undermining development gains made with the poorest and the most vulnerable people most exposed to the more frequent and severe droughts and major storms which our world is experiencing. And as uh, we watch our TVs this very weekend, we see this next very, very large storm uh, wreaking its damage in the Philippines. With nearly a third of global greenhouse gas emissions coming from farming, forestry and livestock production, Achieving sustainable landscapes is critical to climate change mitigation. And I speak as a New Zealander, a country whose greenhouse gas profile is 50% uh, from the uh, agricultural uh, greenhouse gases, 40% uh, of, of that nitrous oxide, and uh, the other 60% the methane emissions from uh, animals. Our pretty landscapes of agriculture are sometimes extremely damaging. Uh, to our climate. But we also see sustainable landscapes as essential for adaptation to climate change and for sustainable development overall because they are safeguarding and delivering that wide range of social, cultural, environmental and economic benefits, including the water and energy, which also underpin food security. So it is encouraging to see that key elements of sustainable landscapes are featuring among the 17 goals of the 169 targets which the UN General Assembly's Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals has proposed. And these include the protection, the restoration and the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainable management of forests, reversing land degradation and halting biodiversity loss. In September in New York, the Secretary General hosted the Large Climate Summit. And there, sustainable agriculture, climate smart agriculture, and forest protection were recognized as indispensable components of the fight against climate change. The clear message was that without decisive action on land use through climate smart agriculture, and efforts to curb deforestation and restore forests, global warming cannot be limited to a two degree scenario. The good news is that a very wide range of stakeholders came together in New York at that summit to back what has been called the New York Declaration on Forests and to make very specific and ambitious commitments to action on forest protection. And I wish to acknowledge uh, Paul Polman, Unilever's CEO, on our panel today, 
and many other CEOs in the private sector whose remarkable leadership on land use and forests has really become a game changer in this area. The New York Declaration on Forests has been described as the key outcome of the Climate Summit. There, 175 different entities, including the governments of developed and developing countries, of states and provinces, major companies, indigenous leaders, civil society organizations, committed to the goal of halving deforestation by 2020 and ending it by 2030. And they also committed specifically to restoring 350 million hectares of forests. That is an area, I understand, roughly equivalent to the size of India, so it's rather large. The governments which endorsed the declaration committed, and I quote, to support and help meet the private sector goal of eliminating deforestation from the production of agricultural commodities like palm oil, soy, paper, and beef products by no later than 2020, recognizing that many companies have made more ambitious targets. If the commitments made in the declaration are met, they will produce emission reductions equivalent to removing all the cars currently on the world's roads, rather a significant contribution. In the past year, a number of the forest countries have made a lot of progress on developing and implementing their forest strategies, and their actions are increasingly supported by international finance. As well, parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change concluded the Warsaw Framework on Red Plus, and more than 50 major companies have made substantial commitments to eliminating deforestation from their supply chains. At the Climate Summit then in September, the leaders from these different sectors, public and private, uh, community, built upon the progress by coming forward with new individual and collective commitments. Private sector leaders set out what their sectors can contribute to stopping deforestation. And what would help them do that? Companies made new and expanded commitments on achieving the deforestation-free supply chains. And it's a powerful message, isn't it? Don't try to sell us stuff from that land because we're not going to buy it. I think this is absolutely critical. Forest countries committed to reduce deforestation and or restore degraded lands. A number of the donor countries in New York voiced their support for the inclusion of Red Plus in the new global climate change agreement. Germany, Norway and the United Kingdom committed to scaling up results-based finance for Red Plus, beginning with funding for 20 major new programs by 2016. Several of the largest forest commodity importing countries committed to new procurement policies which encourage deforestation-free supply chains. There was there the Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force, which is a grouping of 26 subnational uh, governments covering a quarter of all tropical forests in the world. They committed to reducing deforestation in their jurisdictions by 80% by 2020 if they can be supported by large-scale results-based payments. You can see a lot of these commitments are interlocking. Everybody has to act. Critically, at the summit, the vital role of indigenous peoples in forest protection was fully recognized. A global coalition of indigenous peoples pledged to put their weight behind the protection of hundreds of millions of hectares of tropical forests across the Amazon and Congo basins, Indonesia and Mesoamerica in the service of climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation. While a lot of work remains to be done, these very strong expressions of action and cooperation on forests at the Climate Summit was inspirational for all who were there. And the spirit of partnership across these different sectors and communities shown in reaching the New York Declaration on Forests bodes very well for continued progress. And there has to be continued progress if our forests are to survive and play their critical ecosystem service role. So the progress made 
in this past year gives a clear sense now of the steps which have to be taken on forest issues between now and next year's climate change COP in Paris. What are these steps? The developing forest countries will need to put forward nationally determined mitigation contributions which have in them ambitious goals and policies to reduce forest loss and increase reforestation. They could identify how much they can achieve unilaterally and how much more could be achieved with international support. They should continue to implement and enforce land use reforms which will enable them to develop without destroying forests. This will take very strong political will and leadership and the broader international community does need to support these efforts. Secondly, the advanced economies need to deliver large-scale economic incentives for forest protection, particularly through Red Plus in the context of the new climate agreement we hope will be reached next year. 2014 was the year in which many in the private sector stepped up to tackle deforestation. Can 2015 be the year when governments step up to deliver on the promise of Red Plus? And they have worked rather hard on the design of it over the past seven years. Thirdly, the private sector needs to eliminate deforestation from its supply chains without delay. And that means expanding the existing commitments to cover a rather wider range of commodities than are covered in the pledges at present and bringing many more companies in both developed and developing countries on board. Then, indigenous peoples must be empowered to continue to play their vital role in recognising forests. Governments must formalise and protect their rights, and the private sector too must respect their right to give or withhold free prior and informed consent. We must see conflicts resolved in a manner which is consistent with good governance, equity and respect for human rights and human dignity. The UN system is very committed to building on the progress around the forest issues over the last year and advancing this agenda and the landscape and climate smart agriculture agendas. At UNDP, we'll be working very closely with our United Nations partners in the UN RED program, that is FAO and UNEP, as well as with the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility. We will keep on working with Paul Polman and others in the powerful multi-sector coalition which came together around forests for the Climate Summit. And we want to help build on the momentum of the New York Declaration on Forests and carry the very strong partnerships which have been formed around it through to the Paris Conference of Parties and beyond. So let me end by emphasizing what we all know. A two degree climate change scenario is not possible without making real progress on sustainable landscapes, including on our forests. The cooperation and the commitment of leading actors represented here at this forum is so critical for success. And please count on UNDP, UNEP and FAO, the UN Red Partners, to walk every step of this journey uh, with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark, for those very inspiring opening comments and keynote. Uh, I would now like to invite to the dais Mr. Pullman.